This week on Phone a Friend, Harry's sloppy makeout, Gwyneth's bougie trial, a shocking boy band breakup, and my childhood fantasies come true when I call icon legend queen Elvis Stoiko. It's like skating naked in a way. Open your mouths, stick out your tongues, let's make another episode of Phone a Friend. Girl, let's phone a friend with Jesse Kripschick. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Phone a Friend, my phone of friends. I'm Jesse Kripschick. And there's a lot of shit going on in the world, but this is a safe space to escape it all. The darkest thing I've ever talked about on this podcast is uh, Blippi taking a dump on someone else. Jason, could you confirm? Is that as dark as we've gone on this show? I think so. Yeah. 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 And it was. It was dark. And I want to keep it that way. I hated that so much. I'm so sorry to force everyone to revisit that, even just mentally, because uh, it was traumatic. But today, I'm feeling excited. Like excited in my pants, because I'll be phoning the man who I believe was my first ever celebrity crush. Human crush. Like, I was obviously attracted to Michelangelo, the mutant ninja turtle. I was very into the ripped anthropomorphic turtle uh, when I was a child who wasn't. But when Elvis Stoiko hit the ice in tight leather studded pants, my 11-year-old self was like, Michelangelo who? I have found my new bad boy. And decades later, for some reason, he's agreed to talk to me about everything. That's coming up. And while we're on the subject of crushes, this is how love works. This is my Dr. Ruth moment. This is how love works. You have your first cartoon crush, okay, on a literal cartoon. Could be a Ninja Turtle or like Dave from Alvin and the Chipmunks, their dad or caretaker. He sometimes did it for me. And then you have your first celebrity crush. But perhaps more importantly, you have your first real life crush. So my first crush happened at six years old, grade one. And it was obviously with the hottest, most popular boy at Ecole Jules Quenelle in Vancouver. I couldn't have fallen for, like, the dork that would actually pay attention to me. I had to fall for the hunk of my elementary school. I mean, this kid had a natural tan in Canada. He had a flawlessly executed Devon Sawa bowl cut, like, perfect undercut. He had the first hypercolor shirt I had ever seen and invited every kid to blow on it, except for me. I think I had maybe four interactions with him in total in my entire elementary school experience, but he was so kind and charming and charismatic, even at six. When we were 11 and 12, my best friend Kate and I would walk an extra block every morning on the way to school so we could walk by his house in hopes that he might notice that. He never did, and we went to different high schools, and I had not seen him for 25 years until last week. So whenever the Vancouver Canucks play the L.A. Kings, a friend of mine from Vancouver gets a box and invites everyone in L.A. who's from Vancouver, which is oddly mostly celebrities. It's like a box filled with stars of stage and screen and any other Vancouverites who happen to be in the city are welcome to join. So I walk in and the first person I notice is not a sitcom star. It's this tall, tanned chiseled man standing in the corner of the box with flowing hair. He's wearing all whites and creams, not in like a tacky ditty white party way, more like in a Gwyneth in court way, like wealthy creams. He turns to me like an apparition in cream, okay, as if there was a light from the heavens shining down upon him. And I think, oh my fucking God, it's him. And he says, Jesse, and I swear to God, I could not speak. It's my elementary school crush. Suddenly, I'm like nine years old all over again. He's go- he says, oh, my God, what has it been, 25 years? And I was like, M-ha-ha. and he gives me this hug. It's like the kind of hug that is 
that like makes you feel something. It was like a, like a beat too long. He just held on tight. And the whole time we talk, I'm studying his face like they do on Love is Blind once they meet in real life and they're trying to see like who the person they knew in the pods is in this face. At one point, he like laughed and my insides turned upside down. I was like, there is that face. It's the same laugh. It's the same dimples. It's this boy I have loved for the four and a half years of my life. And can I tell you, he has aged like a fine wine. Oh my God. He has no kids. Hot. Super successful, very into health and nutrition, lives by the beach. He has an artist girlfriend, which he'd mentioned probably too many times. At one point, he leans in and he says, in my ear, can I tell you something crazy? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, I used to have the biggest crush. I'm like, "Mm mm-hmm, on your best friend, Kate. Which is classic, by the way. Everybody had a crush on my best friend, Kate. He says, I would watch you guys walk by my house every morning and I would just stare at her. And at that point, I like had to wrap the conversation up immediately so I could tell Kate because she is still my best friend. And like, you know, she was the first person I told I was pregnant with twins. But this news was bigger. All this to say, I now follow my elementary school crush on Instagram, and more importantly, it felt satisfying to know that even at six, I had good taste. He turned out to be like, he's a sweet guy, he's a kind person, he's a successful person, a hot person. We would have had a great life together if he had spoken to me and not been in love with my best friend. A great life. And this kind of clammy, messy, childlike lust takes us right into what has been a week. It's been a week, yeah. On Saturday, the makeout heard round the world popped up on all of our phones. And the first thing I thought was, can it be Thursday I must discuss? Harry Styles and Emily Ratajkowski, arguably two of the hottest, most single people on earth, were photographed and filmed making out and dancing, if we could call it that. It was like a weird shimmy on the streets of Tokyo. Jason, I think this is a definitive pop cultural moment that we will all remember. Like when Diana died or Brad and Jen divorced. Oh Where were you? <laughs> what? You disagree? I don't, I mean, no. I mean, yes and no. Do you remember where you were when this popped up on your phone on Saturday afternoon? No, I probably was in bed watching Gwyneth Paltrow trial. (laughs) Yes, Jason has been obsessed with the Gwyneth Paltrow trial, which we will get to. Thank you for your time investment on that. Um, I felt like this makeout... Um, I was, by the way, sitting with my children watching Ninjago, and I think I let them watch like seven <laughs> episodes in a row while I just watched this makeout from all angles. It's shocking because Harry Styles is the most famous, possibly most beloved man on the planet. Am I wrong in saying that? He's loved by children, parents, grandparents. He's loved by me. He is fresh off this Grammy win, this record-breaking tour. He's at the peak of his career. He doesn't make a lot of like public mistakes. Even with his relationship with Olivia Wilde, they were rarely photographed. If they were, it was tepidly holding hands in a sweater vest, not sloppily making out in the streets. But here he is doing what we all did in college, or for me, slightly past college, as we discussed on this podcast with Dan Levy. I think we can all assume they're a little drunk, right? They're making out against a van. They don't care who sees. The headlines all say they're caught, quote, in a steamy kiss. I'm just here to say it was not that steamy. He's got this big, wide open mouth. His tongue is like attacking her lower face. He has his hand on her bum, which I know because the Daily Mail circled it and zoomed in on the hand on the bum. Journalism. But it's not a clench. It's not like a sexy clench. It's kind of just a pat. It's like the kind of pat that a man gives a man in sports. This is obviously devastating to the Harry Styles community, of which I am a part. Not just because he's making out with one of the world's most attractive women. With otherworldly breasts. Can we just say it? I mean, Jason, you're watching Gwyneth Paltrow in Turtlenecks. I'm just looking at this woman's breasts. (laughs) I mean, she has the body I prayed for while lusting after Elvis Stoiko as an 11-year-old. 
period. The Harry Styles community also devastated because now we have to come to terms with the fact that Harry Styles is not a good kisser. And if you're thinking, Jesse, come on, it's a drunk makeout. Wrong. I urge you to revisit the Don't Worry Darling trailer. I'm not going to make you sit through that movie, but just watch the trailer again. Because even in like a dapper suit in the 1950s, it's the same open mouth, okay? The tongue is out. My theory is this boy can't kiss probably because he never had to learn how. He's been famous since he was 16 years old. He never felt insecure. He never had to practice on a teddy bear. He's had girls throwing themselves at him for over a decade, and he's just been receiving them with that big old open mouth ever since. And can we talk about her? Because I love her. I think she's smart, stunning. Again, those breasts. So her husband cheated on her. They divorced after having a baby. The baby is now two, and she has been seen with six men in seven months. You have Pete Davidson, Brad Pitt, Eric Andre, two tall rich guys I don't know, an artist and a DJ, which tracks. A lot of people have been shaming her as a mother and a woman. I say, go for it. Live your life, please. If I had that face and that body, I'd also be dancing with Harry Styles on the streets of Tokyo. I'm not even jealous of the hookup. I'm jealous of the energy. With a two-year-old at home to not only stay up dancing, drinking, and making out, but to do it in Tokyo? That's a flight. That's a time change. Okay, I flew to Toronto a week and a half ago. I'm still recovering. And... The kid was in Japan with her. If she went home with Harry Styles, she still had to get up with that kid at God knows what hour. The stamina cannot be understated. And we can't forget about the Olivia Wilde of it all because her and Emrata are friends, which like really takes the open mouth sloppy tongue situation and makes it even sloppier. Emily Ratajkowski was spotted sitting next to Olivia Wilde at a Harry Styles concert while they were dating. There were rumors that they had a threesome. Jason, you brought this up to me. You read this? I, I Yeah, I read it. I don't believe this. Unconfirmed, because, obviously, but... No, you can't. It's not confirmed. Because what woman is dumb enough to let Emily Ratajkowski in on your relationship? If you do, you deserve this. My man would run away to Japan with her, too. So threesome or not, Harry followed Emrata on Instagram the month he broke up with Olivia Wilde. What? And Olivia and Emily were sitting together at the Vanity Fair Oscar party less than two weeks before the makeout. According to Page Six, which is fact, Emily has been begging Olivia Wilde for her forgiveness since the makeout video surfaced. I mean, I say why? Like, sure, not super cool to go for a friend's ex ever, but they broke up. He's fair game. I'm sure Olivia is thinking back to that concert like, so you were just sitting next to me ogling my man the whole night. But the fact is, everyone in the stadium was ogling your man the whole night. I'm ogling your man right now, looking at pictures on the Daily Mail while recording a podcast. In conclusion, I hope this relationship lasts. I want to see more. I also feel reassured that if two of the sexiest people on the planet can look this unsexy making out, there is hope for the rest of us. In more former One Direction or Couple news I did not see coming. Former One Direction or Couple news I did not see coming. Selena Gomez and Zayn who is basically Madonna. He's basically Prince Harry. He needs no last name. They were uh, allegedly spotted entering a New York hotspot around 10.30 p.m. Again, I'm tired already. They were holding hands. They were making out. I also endorse this behavior. Yes, Selena once described Zayn's ex and mother of his child, Gigi Hadid, as one of her, quote, best friends. So this is another sloppy friends taking friends exes situation. But let me just shout this out from the rooftops. I am here for all people in their 20s making out in public places. That's what your 20s are for. They are. I'm pretty sure they are in their 30s, though. Just FYI. Are they really? I think so. 
I'm mm. googling it now, but okay. Hey, confirmed. Yes, confirmed. Yeah. Okay. I am here for all people in their thirties making out in public places. It is what your thirties are for. Yeah, your early thirties. Let's keep it in the earlies. It is an undisputed fact that while Harry has emerged the hottest star from One Direction, Zayn was always the hottest member of the band at the time of the band. Would you agree, Jason, my producer? My not. Uh, I don't <gasps> disagree, disagree, but my number. I don't disagree, but my, my number one would have been Liam. Liam Payne. Yeah. No. Before, uh... before the. It's this is okay. This is very hard to say because before, like two years ago, I would have said yes. He's since had some sort of strange plastic surgery. Who has? Or fit Liam. Liam Payne? Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, no. maybe not plastic surgery, but like Googling. Jason, or Jason, Liam Payne is the Howie of the group. It's no. a shocking no. choice. <gasps> oh my God. Uh, Jason. Right? It's like a, it, he's, it's, he has a Zac Efron face. It's like it's a, a, a jawline. It's a buccal fat. Yeah. It's yeah, a buccal yeah, yeah. fat. Oh, this Liam Payne looks like the new Barney. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. Confirmation. He's done something shocking to his face. So now he's no longer your number one. No. Oh my God. Uh, He has done a number on his face. And now I'm not even thinking about Zayn and Selena. I'm just thinking about Liam's buccal fat. Buckle fat. Either way. Okay, thank you. I wish them well. I hope they make out in New York hotspots at 10.30 p.m. for at least the next two, two to three years. Then we need to reevaluate our life choices. What's next? What's next? We've come to less hot couple news. Backstreet Boy AJ McLean. Sorry, did you think I wasn't going to cover this shit? This is a top story here on this pod. AJ McLean and his wife have announced they're separating. But wait, not like for real, for real. They released a statement to TMZ saying they have, quote, mutually decided to separate temporarily to work on ourselves. The plan is to come back together and continue to nurture our love for one another and our family. We ask for respect and privacy at this time. If you listen to the Chris Kirkpatrick episode, you know I should probably release my own statement to say, hmm. The separation of A.J. McLean and his wife had nothing to do with me or him giving me his skull ring at an event in 2019. Please respect my privacy at this time. I mean, my question is, is this even a separation? We're going to work on ourselves and come back to nurture this marriage? That sounds like me on a Saturday night when Evan and I got in a dumb fight about putting clothes in the wrong laundry basket and I stormed off to watch Love is Blind. That was me working on myself. Sunday morning, we came back together to nurture the marriage. This doesn't sound like it's worthy of a TMZ announcement on a Monday. Because you know real divorces get announced on Friday afternoon. See Reese Witherspoon last Friday. Also, you know I love A.J. McLean, but I'm really sorry to say this, but like, who is invading his privacy? Who would have said... You know, I haven't seen A.J. McLean out with his wife much. I've never seen him out with his wife, except for her brief appearance in the No Place video. I don't even really know what she looks like. It all just feels very unnecessary. Unless we're filing legal documents, there is no need for a TMZ announcement. Working on yourselves to keep the marriage alive is just called marriage. Either way, we wish them luck. Again, I assure you I had nothing to do with this, even if I am wearing his skull ring on my wedding finger right now. And I hope he does one day say to his wife, you'll always be the one I want to come home to because there ain't no place, ain't no place like you. Hmm, what a jam. Let's move on to Shawn Mendes news. For anyone keeping track, today I've covered Harry Styles, Zayn, Liam Payne, AJ McLean, and Shawn Mendes. It's your show, girl. It's my show. I am a 14-year-old girl stuck in an old breastfeeding body. Before I phone Elvis motherfucking Stoico, just a quick style tip from Shawn Mendes. I think the crop tops are they're super beautiful. They look they great on men. Fit. They look great on men, so don't don't be afraid to pick them up, guys. They look good. <laughs> Says a man who has 1% body fat and visible penal bones. <laughs> Is that the technical term, Jason? What are those bones called? They call it like 
Um, like a V, a V something. That's the technical term, a V something. Well, like I think the technical, it's like your pelvis, if that's what you're thinking of. Oh, but, yeah, okay, um, you're right. Like <laughs> you're right, you're right. Pelvis bones, visible pelvis bones, right? We are doctors here on this show, but you know the bone I'm talking about. I'm with Sean. I, too, would like to see more men in crop tops. No men that I know personally in any context. (laughs) I don't want to see any man I know in a crop top, okay? I don't want to see the daycare dads doing drop-off in a crop top. But other men who look like Sean Mendes, sure, let's see that midriff pop, throw on a low-rise jean and a belly chain and get it. And now every single one of you is visualizing your man or a man in your life in a crop top. And I blame Sean Mendez for that. Thanks, Sean. What's next? Court is in session for Gwyneth Paltrow. And like a goop gift guide at Christmas time, this trial keeps on giving and giving. Gwyneth took the stand to testify in a $600 cashmere goop sweater. And we can't look away. By we, I mean Jason. You cannot look away. No. You have watched every minute of yes. Gwyneth on the stand. And I forced you to talk about this today. (laughs) No, I've seen the clips, uh, but I haven't invested the kind of time that you have. If you haven't invested hours in watching the case like Jason, my producer, has, here's a 30-second recap of why they're in court. Start the clock. In 2016, Gwyneth was skiing at the super bougie Deer Valley Resort in Park City, Utah. While skiing, there was a collision between Gwyneth and a 76-year-old optometrist. The eye doctor says she hit him and fled the scene. She says he hit her and she didn't need to stay. Plus, her kids were waiting at the bottom of the hill. He's suing her for $300,000 for brain damage. She's countersuing him for $1.00. I have brain damage just trying to keep up. Ooh, that's my kind of sport. So if this were just Jason's show, he would just play the entire two-hour testimony for you. But (laughs) here's what we're going to do instead. I'm going to list off my top five favorite Gwyneth moments from the trial so far. And at the end, I'll collect my thoughts, my polls, and my goggles and decide on a final verdict right here, right now. This is Judge Jesse. Number one, we need to put this out there. Gwyneth is not the only person getting attention for this trial. The optometrist's attorney, Kristen Van Orman. I mean, frankly, she should be making a candle that smells like her vagina because people can't get enough of her. She's been asking Gwyneth all these bizarre questions, ranging from irrelevant to rude to even a bit fangirly. Exhibit A. May I ask how tall you are? I'm just under five. Ten. Okay. I am so jealous. I think I'm shrinking, though. <laughs> you and me both. I have to wear four-inch heels just to make it to 5'5". Five, five, well, so. They're very nice. Well, thank you. This is so funny to me. They're just chatting about shoes while her client sits there with broken ribs and brain damage. I can't. It's almost flirtatious. It's like I'm on their first date. I mean, I'm no lawyer, but if this is what you do as a lawyer, then maybe I am. Because I met Gwyneth once a few years ago, and I, too, was like, you're so tall. You're so beautiful. Your skin, your hair. She's, like, strikingly statuesque and gorgeous in person. So I understand the inability to concentrate on your legal line of questioning when faced with that kind of ethereal beauty. And honestly, if Gwyneth called my shoes very nice, I would quit my legal team and join hers. That's all it would take. Number two. After the accident, Gwyneth says she yelled at the man for not watching where he was going. He claims she verbally assaulted him. But Gwyneth has a public image to uphold here. Listen to this. And that's when you were furious and said you skied directly into my effing back at the top of your lungs. Yes, I did. Okay. I apologize for my bad language. (laughs) You can hear the smirk in her voice. I apologize. I mean, there's no sincerity. It feels like this is a big joke to her. And it kind of is. She's being sued for $300,000, which is pocket change when you're worth $200 million. Gwyneth doesn't want money. She just wants her half a day of skiing back. Which brings us to my third favorite moment. Number three, while the optometrist claims he suffered serious bodily harm and traumatic brain injuries, leading to a loss in quality of life, Gwyneth claims she lost half a day of family fun. He has deterred you from enjoying the rest of what was a very expensive vacation. Well, I lost 
half a day of skiing. Uh-huh. Yes. Right. Irreversible brain damage, missing out on hitting a couple of slopes, basically the same thing. But again, not about the money for Gwyneth. She just doesn't want to be proven wrong. It's about principle here, which brings us to moment number four. So Gwyneth is suing for one dollar, which is just a big fuck you. Apologies for my bad language. She doesn't need anyone's money. This one dollar is symbolic, right? Remember when Taylor Swift sued a radio DJ for one dollar for touching her butt and she won? It's a way to sue someone on principle. But for some reason, this attorney, Kristen Van Orman, wants everyone to know that Gwyneth stole that idea from Taylor Swift. And so she asks about their friendship in court. Are you good friends with Taylor Swift? No. You're not good friends with Taylor Swift. I would not say we're good friends. We are friendly. I take my kids, I've taken my kids to one of her concerts before, but we don't talk very often. Ooh, sorry, Taylor. First Carly Kloss and now this. Sounds like Apple's paying full price for the Eras tour. We've come to number five. Finally, after a long list of annoying questions and a few bottles of Perrier later, Gwyneth is clearly fed up and gets in a shady jab at the lawyer Kristen by doing what all mean girls do best, not remembering who she is. You learned that Mr. Standerson broke four ribs. Yes. Okay. Did you learn of that that day? No. Did you inquire? What is your name again? Sorry. Kristen? Yes. Sorry, I was going to say, Kristen, I think you have to keep in mind when you're the victim of a crash, right, your psychology is not necessarily thinking about the person who perpetrated it. I mean, it's so good. This is like when Mariah claimed she didn't know who J-Lo was. It's such a power play too, right, producer? Uh, sorry, I forget your name. John? Is it Jerry? Sorry, what are you still there? <laughs> Shut up. What do you even what do you even do here, Jimmy? See what I did? I just bam, I instantly put you beneath me. Oh my god. <laughs> just like that. It hurt, actually. Yeah. I don't have anything to say. No, please. I just Kristen Van Dormand you. Right here on the spot. That was a powerful lawyer move that I just did right there, Jace. Your name is Jason. And now that I have investigated five key moments from this, the trial of the century, the time has come for I, Judge Jesse, to reach my final verdict in this, the case of Gwyneth Paltrow versus Old Eye Doctor. (laughs) After reviewing the evidence, but mostly the fashion, Okay, I see her $3,500 The Road Trench, her $1,200 Celine boots, her $17,000 gold necklace. She has worn more than $300,000 worth of clothes in the trial. And therefore, I know the trial is not about money for her. She could have given him the three hundred grand and just kept this out of court and prevented all the memes and the Jeffrey Dahmer comparisons. But she didn't do that because she wanted justice. He hit her, or they crashed at the same time, and when he realized it was a wealthy celebrity, he decided to get that goop money and sue, and that is why I'm about to say something I never thought I would. I declare justice for Gwyneth Paltrow. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, give her that one dollar so she can slip it to Kristen Van Orman on her way out of court like a tip for the help. Justice is served. Jason, are you satisfied? Yes. It's Jason, right? Very much so, yes. Okay. Do you agree? Yeah, well, 100%. Yeah, I'm team team Gwyneth, yeah. Okay, I'm going to take off my judge's robes and slip into my sequins and mesh because the time has come to call the man who caused a flutter in the hearts and pants of young Canadians everywhere when he hit the ice in leather and a mullet in the early 90s. It's time to phone a friend. Girl, let's phone a friend. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I am phoning Elvis Stoiko, skater, author, Olympian, icon, my first celebrity crush, the man who literally revolutionized figure skating. I want to ask him about those leather pants, about Tanya Harding, about angry fans, the backwards roots hat, so much more. 
Jesse, how are you? <laughs> Hello, Elvis. Oh my God. I'm sorry. Um, is this seven time Canadian champion, three time world champion, two time Olympic silver medalist, and one time first crush of mine, Elvis Stoiko? I, I, I believe so. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. I'm going to try to remain calm for the duration of this conversation, but this is a big moment for me. Like whatever euphoria you experience winning all of those championships and medals, I am feeling right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank Come you, on. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Okay. I don't know if you remember this. I have met you one other time, Elvis. Um, okay. I was hosting the Olympic morning show on CTV during the 2010 Olympic Games, and you taught my co-host Dan Levy and I a full figure skating routine in Robson Square. We were wearing like head-to-toe sparkly unitards. Have you blocked oh my- that out? No, Do you remember oh that? my gosh, I totally remember that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's <laughs> awesome. I totally remember that. <laughs> I thought that, are you being serious? I thought that would have no, fallen no. to like the bottom barrel of Elvis Stoiko life experiences. No, 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 no. Okay. I remember that it was outdoors. Yes, there was a crowd. It was so much fun. We had a good time. Okay, well, now I get to talk to you without picking a shiny uh, silver spandex out of my batok. So I'm really excited <laughs> for this conversation. Are you at your home in Bowmanville right now? Yeah, I am in my home, yeah. I'm not going to show up with a headshot and a knife. Don't worry. <laughs> He's like, <"Yep." laughs> And you you live there. You're happily married. You married a skater, right? Yep, Mexican gal from the north of Mexico. Yeah, yeah she skated, was on the national team, did Worlds, and then she toured with uh, Disney. And uh, yeah, we met in Mexico, and I brought her back to Canada. And uh, yeah, we're loving it here. Ugh, that's so lovely. I'm going to declare my love for you anyways, though, because I was 11 years old When I first saw you hit the ice at the Lillehammer Olympic Games, Mm -hmm. you're representing my country. You are wearing studded leather pants, matching vest, tight black T-shirt. Your mullet is blowing in the wind. You're landing toe loop after axle after Lutz. (laughs) And I remember thinking, like, who is that? (laughs) Are you aware that you single-handedly brought about the sexual awakening of many a Canadian girl in the 90s? Well, you know, back in the day when I was skating, it was it was all about trying to show my side of what I thought skating was. It was sort of just how I was. People attacked me for being too macho, and I laughed because it's just it's just who I was. And and I we we came up Ushi, my choreographer. We, we were like, we got to do something different this year. That's why we came up with the uh, going towards with the martial arts program, of course, the honoring the Bruce Lee yes. program. We did all of that. And then, and then I wanted to do techno and dance and something a little bit different. And it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy time and I got picked on for it, but then I got so much support on the other side of it as well to go out there and do that. It was so much fun. It was literal iconography, Elvis. Like that doesn't surprise me. Cause you went out there like, and I want to, Go back to your head space if we can, because you literally revolutionized the entire sport in doing that. So 1994, you show up to those Olympic Games. You know these international judges are stuffy. You know that they like classical music, sequins mesh. You do martial arts. You have an earring. You have long hair. Like, what made you do that at 21? How did you just Give no fucks. <laughs> well, the fi- this is the thing is is building your team, and my team was my choreographer, right. my coach, my martial arts trainer, my acupuncturist. You know, like everyone in the group, my parents, mm. all going in the same direction, and they always believed in me and how I wanted to to showcase my style. And for many years, it was hard for me to find a style because. I was looking externally. Mm. I was looking at all my heroes and I was watching everyone, all the big names back in the 80s. And I was like, I just got to be me. And it takes time to find who you are on the ice. I just told Ushi one day, Ushi goes, what type of music you like listening to? And so we played with different things on the ice. And then all of a sudden, I started to evolve and I started to, to come out of my shell. And all this really cool stuff started happening. And she goes, that's you. And she goes, how do you feel? I said, I feel great. And she always said to me, she goes, Elvis, you have to believe in your style and who you are so much that you will defend it even against me. Wow, Ushi. Yeah, she was like uh, unbelievable. Did anyone ever tell you to do it differently? Like, did anyone say no, try to be softer, more graceful? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Whether it was 
TFSA, uh, which is Skate Canada, TFSA at the time, there's completely different people at the time. You know, ISU people, judges, they, you know, you got to skate to the classical stuff and you got to do this and you should go this direction. And then after Olympics, I mean, back then we didn't have email and I, I ended up getting like letters and people, you know, saying, oh my gosh, it was great. And I got this letter from this guy in the U.S. and it was a letter. I opened it up and I was in shock. He was like, that was terrible. The, it, martial arts is boring to the point of nausea. Uh, you shouldn't even won the silver medal. And he just, <gasps> he went on, he, he took the time to write this letter that was oh like, my, like, it was right. like, it, like two pages of like, I was wow. like, oh my God. And back then when people actually had time and actually took time to do uh-huh. stuff instead of just click a like on online. Right. That's the OG troll right there. Oh my God. He sent it. And I, I got some like hate faxes sent to like the rink and stuff. It was so bizarre. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. I'm going to stop you right there. Did you just say hate faxes? Faxes. Oh shit. 1994 oh, yeah, no. dropping 94. some faxes. <gasps> oh my God. Like when I, I went, when I went to nationals competed and I, and I defeated Kurt there. Yes. I got hate faxes from his fans. I told him about this like not that long ago. He's like, are no. you here? I'm like, dude, your fans are crazy. Like they went after me. The thing that's so funny to me, Elvis, is that it's like when you're angry, you can go to the internet and be like, send. But when you're angry in the 90s, you're like, Kurt Browning is the best. That's real commitment. I was commitment, yeah. So I, I mean, I had, I had such support, and and there's people that even, no matter what you do, you're going to have supporters and non-supporters. But I always thank the non-supporters because it makes you strong and it and it pushes you through all of that. But when I look back on it, the programs that I did, it just happened through me. It just, I allowed it to happen. It was easy. It flowed. The effortless effort that's there. And if people remember, and that and that's yeah. what like if I just was just anybody else, it wouldn't have been true to who I was and it wouldn't stand the test of time. It wouldn't be authentic. And it was always about being your authentic self. And, and even like now it's coming out even more about being your authentic self. And so I was, that's what made me me. And that's who I am and, and how I look at skating and the things I do, whether I'm racing cars or, or doing other things, it's just, or acting or whatever I'm doing. It's just my authentic self. That's so true. And that's way before people encouraged everyone to be their authentic selves. You said earlier that you would get criticism for being too macho or too masculine. It was ridiculous. They were like, oh, he's afraid to connect with his feminine side and he should be, he's too macho. He's, you know, all this stuff like was against me. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? I'm just being me. I'm just doing my thing. And it wasn't like I planned to be a certain way. Right. And, and when you grow up in front of millions of people, I, I was on the world scene at 17. I was on the national scene at 15. Crazy. You're still a baby. You have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And you're trying to, to, to showcase who you are in a sport that has that art side of it. Mm. And you're unveiling who you are. You're basically, it's like skating naked in a way because you're showcasing who you are and then you're going to get attacked for it. Right. There's a chance for you to go inside yourself again and not blossom and become who you are. You really have to have the courage to go out there and do your thing and, and love what you do and showcase it. Yeah. Life advice with Elvis Stoiko. You can't worry about the hate faxes, <laughs> no, <laughs> so to speak. Hate faxes. It's like so bizarre. Hate faxes. And by the way, it was like you were out there skating naked in those pleather pants. Thank you uh, for that. <laughs> Can we just like dip into the whole conversation around masculinity and figure men's figure skating? Because there is so much glam in the performance of it all. There could be an assumption that this male figure skater must be gay. Did you Mm. have to navigate that in the 90s? Yeah, I got picked on in high school for, Mm. you know, or twinkle toes and this and that. And I went through it all. And, you know, why aren't you doing hockey? And and I was just like, well, have you seen the beautiful women in figure skating? This is rather than (laughs) hanging out in the change room with stinky (laughs) hockey guys, I'd rather be hanging out with the beautiful women skating. I'm like, come on, man. Oh, my God. Where's my air horn? (laughs) It took me a little while before I kind of, you know, grew half a brain and realized I had a really good rebuttal. So you said rebuttal. Got it. Sorry. Rebuttal. Continue. Yeah, yeah, rebuttal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, I, I just, um, you know, I went through it all with all the getting picked on as a male figure skater. And, and um, yeah, and, and then just being, you know, and, and I got picked on the other side, too, within my sport because I was too masculine. And I was just like, oh. Mm-hmm. But my dad, my dad was a um, blue collar worker. He had a... Um, 
a landscaping company, and I don't know how many guys used to come out to see me skate or, or come up to me, um, even on the street uh, yeah. when skating was huge, and say, hey, man, we used to watch you skate. And, and, these, and these guys were all like welders or these are blue-collar workers, like mm. hands-on, you know what I mean? They, they've yeah. got calluses on their hands and like, like, like what my dad was like. And they were like, yeah, we watch skating because of you. And I, we don't watch it anymore because you're not in it. Like that to me yeah. was huge. A lot of um, wives and moms and, and grandmas used to come and say, hey, my husband would not watch skating, but if you were on, he would watch it. Yes. That one right to my heart because I like being the black sheep because now I wasn't just like everyone else. Yes, the black pleather sheep. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why... You are a, an icon to this day. And that word gets thrown around, but you truly are an icon. You were always the bad boy of figure skating, Elvis. Was that the case off the ice? Like, what's the baddest thing you ever did? Baddest thing I ever did? Oh, yeah. my gosh. I was a, I, you know, off the ice is kind of more of a goody two shoes. But <laughs> I just I was too I was too busy just focusing on my dream. I just didn't have time for. Oh, Elvis, mm -hmm. would it help if I provided you with a list? I'll give you a list. Here are some okay. things that a bad boy might do. OK, you tell me if you did them. Yes or no. I'm going to call this um, no more Mr. Ice Guy. No more Mr. Ice Guy. OK, go ahead. Two. Did you smoke? No. Drink. Not really. I try like a taste and be like, meh, never really liked it. Do drugs? Never. Steal? Never. Swear? Like a sailor. <laughs> when I trained, okay, there. <laughs> in the winter, like on yes. the ice when I was training, mm. that is my office. And this is where I train and, and emotion gets in there and things were going my way. Mother second wreck, friggin' black, black and frickin' wreckin'. <laughs> it happened. Yeah. <laughs> and yet you won't even swear for real right here on this podcast. No, you're a gentleman. Uh, no. <gasps> Did you ever break the law? Mm, I'm trying to think. Oh. Actually, we tried to grab a couple of banners from 94. <gasps> I'll forgive you for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever break women's hearts, Elvis Stoiko? I think I have. Um, mm. Mm. A few. In mm. in the past, I mm. think I have. Yeah. Mm. Would you ever get in fights? I had to in in high school a few times to kind of throw down, but it was <gasps> yeah, I wasn't really fights. I had to like kind of put my foot down, grab a kid and throw him against the locker, and just had enough. And being picked on for like months and months and months, and then they showed me on TV. I won the nationals at 15 years old. And then everyone wanted to be my best friend. So oh. it, was, it was one of those. They also saw you doing martial arts on the ice and they were like, yeah, we shouldn't mess with that guy. It was just literally, look, this is, I, I, I don't have time for this shit. Woo! You know, and when I was younger, younger, like grades, like three and four, I had a few scraps in the schoolyard for sure. Okay. Yeah, and, okay. and they were all, and the guys were always bigger, but I'd always win. Okay, hey. The Tasmanian devil, I'm telling you, the little, the little scrapper, so. And that's how you play No More Mr. Ice Guy. No More Mr. Ice Guy. Great job. You failed the bad boy test. You did not, there was not a lot of yeses there. So let me ask you this, because from like 94 to 2000. Three. There's no one more famous in the country than you. Did it ever go to your head? Like if social media had been around then, would we have seen leaked videos of you stealing banners or peeing in mop buckets or making out on the streets? <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe, maybe kissing a girlfriend or making out in the street. Maybe, but um, I don't know if like, I honestly, social media back then it, it with skating being so big. Like we, yeah. we sold out venues like in the States, 27,000 seats in St. Petersburg Thunderdome, like with Nancy Kerrigan and the whole group. We like, that was my first show down in the U S that year. It yeah. was skating was massive. And I couldn't imagine what it would have been like with social media. Like mm -hmm. I would have been attacked. Forget about hate faxes. I would have given attacked. I would have to probably shut my, my, um, yeah. My turn account those off. comments off. Uh -huh. oh, no, I, I'd be like leading up to Olympics. I'd be like off. I'm not taking any comments. The Ariana DeBose of figure skating. Go on. Oh, it, it was crazy. I know. I know some of the skaters in the U.S. when they were um, getting ready for like, I think it was 2014 and 18. Back then, when social media was coming in, people yeah. were like jumping on them right away for just 
I don't know, you make a slightly wrong comment and something goes off and you're like, holy cow, it's so sen- like sensitive with, with everything. And you don't know, you know, it, and, and people have uh, access to celebrities or, or sports celebrities or people of, in, in the limelight. Yeah. And it's really hard. It's not an easy place to be. And I'm glad we didn't have social media back then, honestly. Yes. I mean, we could have maybe caught you saying the S word on camera. Imagine that, Elvis. Shoot. <laughs> you mentioned Nancy Kerrigan before we leave 1994, which honestly, I never want to because that's the year I peaked. It's also the year Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding compete at the Olympics a month after Nancy Kerrigan's attack. You are there with this drama playing out before your very eyes. What did you see? Tell me everything. It was crazy. I mean, Nancy got there before Tanya did. Okay. We're on a first name basis. Yeah, yeah. Well, yep. I, I toured with them and skated with them. But Nancy, um, you'd know Nancy was coming because you, there was a huge entourage of like security guards everywhere. And they would just push you out of the way. They didn't care. They just like, mm, there comes Nancy. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I'm sure it drove her bananas because cameras were, they, as soon as she got off the bus, Boom! They'd be like right there, and they just oh follow her like, shoot, like, <laughs> oh it, and 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 I know she was just trying to like get ready to compete. Right. It was the very first practice that Tanya and Nancy were on together. Yeah. Because Tanya showed up later, so Nancy's practicing for the first few days, and Tanya mm-hmm. shows up, and it's in the practice ring, so there's not a lot of seats. Right. So we went, uh, a bunch of us, um, mm-hmm. and there's me and Kurt, and a few other people went because there's a number of other skaters on the practice that are not from the U S but we right. knew them. They were friends and they got no, <laughs> no love because everything was about. No. Those two. <laughs> yeah. Cause this is the first time these two women are going to be in the same space. Since this craziness happened at the nationals, this is the first time they're in the same proximity together on the ice for Olympics. So yes, there's these like small little seats along the side. And it was like hundreds of media with like this big cameras. And every time they would kind of skate by each other, just, you know, just sort of resting, you know, going from one element to another. Sca- <laughs> oh, my <God. gasps> it was nuts. oh, my God. And then, of course, all the craziness with the event of her and, you know, Tanya skate lace breaking and the whole drama the and lace all that. Lace break. Was, yes. Yeah, that moment. Like, you were there. I was there. I saw the whole thing. Bonkers. <laughs> That's crazy. When you first heard of that Tanya Harding hit, Yep. Were you as shocked as the rest of us, or did part of you think I need to hire someone to take out Kurt Browning? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I thought maybe Kurt might have hired someone to take me out. I don't know. Hey! Boom, Shade. baby, boom. Shade thrown. You and Kurt Browning obviously had a legendary feud. You mentioned the hate faxes. Did Was there, like, fandoms at the time? Did Kurt Browning have the equivalent of the beehive? Did your fans have a name? It was just Elvis and Kurt fans. They loved Kurt, some loved me, and some loved both, and some loved the whole rivalry. And right. it was just like I, in 93, uh, Hamilton, Nationals, live TV, we we're going to compete. Just before we step out onto the ice, we're waiting for the commercial break, and they just made ice. We're just about to step out, and you see this guy in a, a white jumpsuit running up and down the stands. 18,000 people sold out. He's rallying, Elvis Stoico, Elvis for president. He's wearing a Presley jumpsuit oh, and it yes. was like you see a one side Kurt yeah, Kurt Elvis Kurt it was like it, it, I was Kurt and I remember we were talking about he says it was it was nuts and we had to like focus so hard not to get distracted by the insanity that was happening and I the fans were amazing like they really were um but it, it just it put skating on the map especially in mm. Canada and then yeah. uh, obviously with having that year we had we were one and two in Canada, one and two in the world. Pressure uh, it put put us on our toes, pressures, and it yeah. made us better. Like I always say, I wouldn't be the skater I am today if it wasn't for Kurt because mm. he really pushed me to become the best I could be, and I always thank him for that. That's so special. Um, how many uh, bras and panties have you had thrown on the ice in your career, Elvis? Is that a thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, oh. it's, it's actually, <laughs> okay. it, it, it was actually, this is really funny. Um, 1993 uh-huh. Canadians. You remember the exact competition and year? Yes, go on. Yeah, no, well, it's ingrained in my head because I just <laughs> when the stress is that high and it's so intense, you you it's in, it's it's drilled into you. It's oh, burned yeah. into your memory. Those days, people used to throw flowers on the ice. Those flowers yes. and and stuffed animals, and um, people would throw notes for like, hey, please send me an autograph. So they would have like a tennis ball. People got really smart. 
There'd, oh. be a, they'd be way, way, way up in the seats, and they couldn't throw that far. Uh-huh. So th- there was a bit of weight to a tennis ball. Right. So they would wrap a note <gasps> in it and an address. Hey, can you please send an autograph? So they would they would tape it to the tennis ball, and then they would throw it, and it would make it to the ice. And oh hopefully my god! Put somebody put right. somebody in the back of the head as they, <laughs> you know. So anyway, you would get those. Would you ever send the autographs? I would try to get to everybody. Yeah. Wow. So we I had garbage bags. This is like years garbage bags after garbage bags. So the kids, like all the novices and juniors, loved going through. And I said, Hey, I don't have time. Can you separate all the flowers? Because uh-huh. I would send them to the hospitals, and then I would have all the notes, the ones with addresses that have asked for something or said, Can you put them to the side? Oh my god! And then well, as the team leader goes, uh, and then we got this. And then it was like lingerie. So it was half of a, a two piece of lingerie and it had a, a note on it that had a number on it and the hotel. Oh my God. And then the, the, that was in the short program. And then the long program, I got the matching bottom to it. Oh my God. This woman's and a then, genius. So then, so then the team leader goes, eh, I don't think this is appropriate for the 12 and 13 year olds that are going through all this <gasps> stuff. Cause they put, you know, stuffed animals and like wonderful little things. And then all of a sudden, what is this? And my team leaders are like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I don't know. I think you could have made a 12-year-old's day with that, to be honest. Oh, my God. Um, Elvis, when you look back on your career, would you consider your biggest achievement to be landing the first quad double in history in 91 or to be the only person to actually pull off the backwards roots hat from the 1998 Canadian Olympic apparel collection? I only have those two choices. That those are the only two choices. Only two choices. pulling off the hat. Or the double, the 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 quad double. Um, the level of difficulty is similar. It's a tough one. I still Absolutely. have to lean towards doing the quad double, but oh, um, okay. it's a very close second with wearing the the hat backwards. Yeah, and looking so good in it. When you put that hat on your curly mullet, did you think, "Yes, I look hot"? <laughs> no, <laughs> I did not think that at all. <laughs> Is no, that true? Well, no, what did no, you I, think? I, I was like, I'm at another Olympics. This is awesome. I'm like, uh, you know, spo- we're we're sponsored by Root, yeah. and I was just like, this is this is amazing. Yeah, that was '98. That we had the, the everybody wanted those hats. Those oh. everybody. We, I oh. have, and I, and there was all we had the red ones. Yes, but I have. Ooh. Very rare. I have a white one and a black one. Oh, God I have damn. all three. You're about to get robbed in Bowmanville. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, I have all, I have a three, and the other ones were limited collection, yeah. and, I, and I got, I have all three of them. As yeah. you should, Elvis, as the ambassador for that hat, you influenced me so hard, I went down to the Root store on Robson Street in Vancouver, got myself the backwards red hat, and I remember putting it on my red head and thinking, yes, I look incredible oh no you look amazing oh my red god with red oh, oh my please. god do you know i wanted to wear one of those hats for the duration of this interview and i did find them on ebay do you know how much a red roots hat not the exclusive white or black but do you know how much a red retails for on ebay one of those hats really they, yes I, I i didn't even realize i don't know how much guess now yeah, 300 bucks eh, 9.99 elvis stoico what an outrage Nine ninety nine. Yeah, I couldn't nine believe dollars, it. Nine dollars and ninety nine. Ninety nine cents. Something that iconic should be worth three hundred dollars to a thousand. Easy. 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 It was an Olympic. It was. For, it was from ninety eight Olympics. Come on, <sighs> it's Olympics. I, it's an Olympic paraphernalia. I'm so glad we're both enraged about this. I mean, we should talk to the prime minister. Thank you. Yeah. Something mm-hmm. should be done. The value should mm-hmm. be higher. Um. Okay. Your country is always obviously going to love and celebrate you for winning us two Olympic silver medals. Because I feel like our Canadian identity is as silver. We are always going to be the silver to America's gold. Do you feel satisfied with two silver medals? Or is the competitor in you always going to think back and and wonder how you could have gotten gold? Oh, yeah. The competitor always does. Like, I'm always Mm. like, argh. But the other <laughs> side of the coin is this, is that if I would have won gold, would have things been different for me? Uh-huh. And I, I, I won um, being who I was and mm. being me. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, oh, you got robbed in 94. I'm like, yeah, yeah. But if I, if I would have catered and, and broke down and did a num- uh, and, and, uh, programs that would have been liked and accepted, I would have been, I would have won and people would remember me 
as the gold medalist, but that would be it. Huh. People remember me now as, as, as the way you do is like, yeah. you change the sport. You were, mm-hmm. I'd rather be a cornerstone in something mm-hmm. rather than just, cause I've seen so many, the, the champions that come and go and they'll come and win, but do they make a mark? Mm. That's for me. I've seen that they come and they win and they leave and they're like, yeah. okay, they did came in. But did they make a mark? Did they, did they change how you felt? Yeah. Did they make you feel something when you watch them? It's not if you win, it's how you win. It's how you go about it. That's the thing that people remember. How did it feel when you were watching it? And these are the people that come to me and said, man, I used to feel that excitement when I used to watch you skate on TV or live. And that's what I remember. And that to me is like my gold medal. Elvis, I love that so much. I mean, you made me feel something then, and you're making me feel something now. Like, it really is such a powerful message. You did you on the ice. You were never not you. And as a result, I am so excited to talk to you. Like, (laughs) uh, truly. So I love that answer. I love that so much. As we have discussed, you're an icon of 90s pop culture. So before we go, I want to test your 90s pop culture knowledge against some of today's hottest stories, okay? Is Elvis Stoiko as up-to-date on current topics as he is on 90s trivia? Uh Uh-oh. Not even close. I don't actually, honestly, I'll be, I don't watch the news. My wife fills me on things that happen in the world. I actually don't connect to the world at all. Okay, well, it's a good thing none of these questions are about real news. I'm going to I'm going to fail miserably. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's what I call confidence. He can win silver medals and world championships, but he's going to fail at this. I'm going to call this game now. That's what I call 90s. Here's your first question. All right. Which hit 90s movie followed the trials and tribulations of high school students Cher and Dion? Uh, ah! What was the name of the famous 90s haircut inspired by a TV sitcom star? The haircut. The famous haircut of the 90s. I'll give you a hint. It was a friend star. It was in the famous haircut, the friend star. I'll give you another hint. It was the friend's character, Rachel, inspired a famous haircut. What was it called? Uh, I don't know the name of it, but I know the haircut, but I don't know the name. It was called the Rachel. All right. It was called the Rachel? Yes. Told you I'm going to fail miserably. This is the only thing you've ever failed at in your life, I think. (laughs) Oh, I've failed many things. Go, 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 go. (laughs) What was the highest grossing movie of the 90s? Titanic. See? Sex and the City premiered in 98. Can you name two of the four main characters? Two of the four main characters? Yes. Just Um, need to name two. Oh, my gosh. It's uh, it's, uh, (laughs) a tip of my tongue. I know I probably know the name of the actual actresses rather than the characters i I would accept that i would accept actresses kim cattrall is one um and then the other one that canadian content oh my gosh what's her name sarah jessica parker yes yeah yeah, correct okay Okay, Okay, not bad two in the 90s section moving on to today here we go what is scandaval no idea (laughs) which Famous daughter of an actor turned model turned Justin Bieber's wife got backlash for wearing a Nepo Baby t-shirt. No idea. <laughs> Which famous royal released a tell-all book called Spare? Oh, that's, uh, that's Harry. Yes. Last but not least, who did the thing? No idea. <laughs> the answer I was looking for was Angela Bassett. Elvis Stoiko, you did the thing. That's how you play. (laughs) Now that's what I call 90s. (sighs) Well, I hate to tell you, you didn't even make the podium on that, but it was fun to play, you know, and that's what counts. Did we have fun? Oh, good. We had fun. I had a a blast. When I was younger, I'd be all like nervous. Oh, I'm going to fail. It'll be looked terrible. I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) I don't care. I don't care if I fail. I don't care if I fail. Fail miserably. Go down. You know, swing in in a bad, dazzling ball of flame and enjoy yourself. I'm glad you'll be able to sleep at night after failing my uh, that's what I call 90s quiz on this podcast. Okay, you've had this unbelievable career. You are now headed out on the Stars on Ice tour. This year it starts in Halifax, April 28th. Will there be leather vests? Are you skating to Nickelback, which you have done in the past? What can we expect? I will be wearing tight jeans. Ooh, go on. 
There you go. Uh, for one of the numbers, I can't reveal what number it is, but it's really cool. I've been I've, I've been skating to it a few times now on a few of the club shows to kind of prep for it. Both yeah. new numbers. One is from original Van Halen, and the other one is uh, from the group Shine Down. Just to get more specific, do the jeans have stretch in them, or is that a raw denim? They have stretch in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I wouldn't be able to skate in regular you. jeans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just know like I wouldn't be able to move. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Rip. Do women still throw bras at you at Stars on Ice? Should I wear my nice bra to the show? Because I'm going to have to go to storage to find that. I've, I've never had not, never had that happen at a Stars on Ice show. Oh, well, let me challenge my audience. Phone a friends. You take those bras off when you go see Elvis at Stars on Ice, okay? Elvis, Kurt, whoever you're feeling, you throw that bra down. You hear me? I've had a few proposals. Uh, <gasps> marry me. I've had, I've had a bunch of those. Oh. Uh, just before I'm about to skate, it's really quiet. And then, <laughs> marry me! And then, then it's just, yeah, I've had, an, I've had a number of those. It's fun. I have to reveal to you as we end this conversation, that was me. Yeah, that was me that screaming. Was you? Yeah, every time screaming from the rafters, that was me. Oh, uh, I me. thought I recognized yeah. the voice. Yeah. That's- Will you marry yeah. me? That was me. Yes. Cool. Oh. Well, we'll end this with a successful marriage proposal. Uh, tickets to Stars on Ice are available at starsonice.ca. Elvis Toyko, thank you for literally making my childhood dreams come true as a fully formed adult. I- I'm I'm just so I don't even I don't even have words. I can't even believe I'm talking to you. So thank you. Oh no. Uh, Jesse, thank you so much for having me. I'm just I'm excited to be on this tour. You know, of course, as this Kurt's last run and and I hope people can come out and and uh, be a part of it. I'm absolutely going to be there. Uh, so when you do hear someone screaming, will you marry me? You'll know it's me and everybody should come out. Wonderful. Thanks again. This is great. Thanks, Elvis. Ah, I'll talk to you soon. I won't, but Take in care. my mind, I will. OK, bye. Bye, lots of love. Elvis Stoiko, everybody! We're getting married! Oh my god! Whew, I still have chills. I will absolutely be getting tickets to Stars on Ice and throwing my bra at him on the ice. Probs won't have time to dig out the nice one, so it might have to be my dirty milk-stained nursing bra, but it's the thought that counts. After the break, I'm answering the funniest, most shocking voicemail I've ever received. Take us to commercial break, boys. Commercial break. We're back, and the joy of my life is getting voicemail messages from you. Leave me a message anytime about anything. 323-448-0068. Let's check my voicemail. Check, check, check your voicemail. Hi, Jesse. It's Kit from Toronto, fellow tired twin mom. Um, I'm calling to say I love the music. I sing along to the credits now. Um, but the one that comes on right before the commercials, I can't understand what it says. And I thought it was like, go master eight. But after listening to your sex show with Cat and Nat, I think maybe it wouldn't say that because you seem a bit prudy in a good way. So just wondering if you can clarify what is being sung. Love your show. Bye. Oh, my Oh my God. Kit from Toronto. First of all, I love that you're clearly calling me from the car. Okay, I can like hear your turn signal. I'll take your calls from anywhere. Anytime. Also, I'm so glad the theme song gets stuck in your head. When I asked my friend Jay Melanowski, who is the lead singer of Bedouin Sound Clash, which is like a ska reggae rock band, to write me a boy band inspired theme song. I think my only direction was I wanted him to try to make the word crookshank sexy because that had never been done before in the history of time. And that was it. He comes back to me less than a day later with, I swear to God, four bangers, okay? Like hit pop bangers that real boy bands would have killed to record. Maybe not like an instinct, but Death Five or O-Town would have taken these songs, okay? I couldn't believe it. He just turned them out. Like he was Lou Pearlman in 98. Like he was my own personal Max Martin. So thank you to Jay for making my boy band dream come true. And it is a rite of passage to misunderstand boy band lyrics. That just means you're doing it right. Like I always thought that he was saying, I feel like Kevin when I look in your eyes. I was like, why Kevin? 
Like, why are why do you feel like why do you feel like Kevin? That's like some erotic shit. So, Kit, you are right. It was a misunderstanding. It does not say go masturbate before the commercial break. Although, if you did, good for you. It says commercial break before the commercial break. Rob, my technical producer, Rob, let's roll that. Commercial break. Commercial break. Catchy, right? I will be in the shower literally singing commercial break. But now I guess I have to be careful. Maybe my husband has heard me in the shower singing masturbate. It's a problem that Kit has pointed out to me. Thank you for your call, Kit. So glad we could clear that up. And because you noted my prude, I think you called it my prudiness in the last week's Cat and Nat sex episode, as you said, may I just note this. I posted the clip where Kat says it is possible to break a penis, and the sheer volume of DMs I have received from, like, Kathy in Winnipeg, like, oh yeah, I've done that. It's staggering. I'm saying dozens of messages from people who say they have broken a penis. I didn't even know it was possible. And you're out here like, yep, my husband was just hospitalized last week, eh? What? So to all my phone of friends who are out there breaking penises and taking names, good for you. (laughs) You make me proud to know you to talk to you each week. And for those of you who have not been lucky enough to break a penis, let this serve as inspiration. You know? Starts with a drunken makeout by a van in Tokyo, ends with a broken penis bone. And that's our show. (laughs) What a a weird way to end it. (laughs) Thank you to world champion, Olympic champion, forever dreamboat, Elvis Stoiko, for taking my call and not hanging up immediately. Thank you to Harry Styles and Emrata for letting us live vicariously through their sloppy tongues. And thanks to you, as always, for listening, for reviewing, for subscribing. It really means the world. And now I'm going to order that backwards roots hat for $9.99 on eBay. Have a great week, everybody. We'll talk next Thursday. Bye, Jerry. John. Joey. Jim. Jim. Bye, Jim. Bye. Thanks for everything. Okay, I'm hanging up now. Bye. Phone the Friend was created by our mom, Jesse Crixie. The executive producers are Jesse Crixink and Jason Yanba. The technical producer is Rob. Para, the amazing theme song and sexy interludes are by Jay Melanowski from Badwin Sound Clash. Phone a Friend is part of the ACAST Creator Network. Credits are by us, Ray Gatika and Real Gatika. We're her kids. That's crazy, right? Wow, you're still listening? Okay, see you next week.